sisters. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming for, to the Holy Saturday. Uh, can I invite if uh, Dr. David, is it okay if we move on to here? I think since not many people. Yeah. And those hiding behind the shadows, you know, Uncle Vincent, <laughs> maybe can sit in the middle so it's easier for us to see you. Okay, we'll be starting in two minutes. We'll be starting in two minutes. While waiting for those who have uh, gotten your seat, um, quieten yourself uh, and meditate on, uh, on uh, this Easter weekend. And I will start with prayer later. Can I check if the ones at the back, can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Okay. Let's start uh, with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to just surrender ourselves as we ponder upon the Easter weekend, what you have done in history at one point, um, that you surrender yourself, um, not, you say on the Garden of Eden, not my will, but yours be done. And you surrender yourself completely like a sheep without, uh, that uh, was led to be slain and without a single uh, uh, re rebellion. Lord, we want to thank you for, uh, for doing such a wonderful thing on the cross, uh, saving our sins and uh, bringing us back to you. And therefore, Lord, we pray uh, for tonight as we listen to the second installment of the Easter uh, uh, sermon. Uh, prepare our hearts, Lord, um, and help us to obey. As we start today, we pray that uh, you'll be with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Um, so welcome everybody and also welcome Dr. Living Lee. Thank you for coming. Um, so on every Lent and Easter weekend, we are always drawn to read about the final chapters uh, of the Gospels. And one of the things that never failed to strike me is the paradox and the irony in every detail of the, the final week of Jesus' uh, life before he was crucified. And, and uh, the paradox are, here are some examples. Um, maybe this is mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday during the service. When Pilate presented Jesus as king, here is your king, uh, the king of the Jews, and he put an inscrip inscription, king of the Jews, on top of the cross. Uh, little did they know that he was indeed not only the king of the Jews, but the king of the universe. And as you read further, it also talks about when the mob called for Jesus' crucifixion and they said, may his blood be upon us and our children. The Pharisees and the people are essentially saying that, put the blame on us. And that very moment, little did they know Jesus is actually taking their blame and their sins on himself. When the soldiers strike and mocked him, ask him, prophesy, who hit you? And that very moment, they were actually fulfilling the prophecy concerning Jesus, as mentioned in Isaiah. When a bystander said, he saved others, but he could not save himself. And that very moment, he was actually saving them. They looked at him with contempt, but he looked at him with compassion from the cross. In Romans 11, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him 
and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. May I invite you to, sing the, uh, to stand up to sing the first song, The Perfect Wisdom of Our God. I was reflecting on the Holy Saturday and trying to imagine myself uh, in Jerusalem. What would it be like to witness the death of Jesus? And how would I describe it? The Holy Week began with the triumphal entry to Jerusalem. The whole city was cheering as Jesus rode on the donkey to the city, fulfilling the prophecy in Ze Zechariah. It was the climax of excitement in Jesus' ministry, and some you might even think, they will finally overthrow the Romans. And yet, in less than a week's time, Jesus was captured, he was tortured, he was mocked and crucified. And how would you describe that day? I was thinking and my answer was none. There was no words to describe. The, dis the, the disciples were ne nowhere to be seen. They were scattered, they were scared and shocked. Trying to process everything, and finding a way to make sense. Sometimes our life tragedy hits like a perfect storm, like a loss of a loved one, loss of our job, 
our relationship of health. And sometimes the best thing to do is to be silent and look to God. The next song is a song that reflects on Psalm 42 that perfectly describes this. And I want to read maybe a snippet of this song, which is new. It says, Should my life be torn from me, every worldly pleasure, when all I possess is grief, God, that be then my treasure. Be my vision in the night, be my hope and refuge. Till my faith is turned to sight, Lord, my heart will praise you. Let's sing the second song, Lord, from sorrows deep I call. Lord, from sorrows deep I call When my hope is shaken Torn and ruined from the fall Hear my desperation For so long I pled and prayed God come to my rescue Even so the torn remains Still my heart will praise you Within my troubled soul Questions without answer On my faith this billows roll God be now my shelter Why are you cast down my soul? Hope in Him who saves you When the fires have all grown cold it's hard to praise you. Oh, my soul, put your hope in God. My help, my rock, I will praise Him. Sing, oh, sing through the raging storm. You'll fill my God, my salvation. be torn from me every worldly pleasure when all I possess is grief God be then my treasure be my vision in the night be my hope and refuge till my faith is turned to sight Lord, my heart will praise you. Oh, my soul, put your hope in God. My help, my rock, I will praise Him. Sing, oh, sing to the raging storm. You're still. song in Christ alone.
in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless bay this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the one he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied of Christ I slid there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine for with the precious blood of
purify the world. It was meant for humiliation. cross. It was meant to horrify the world. It was meant for humiliation. It was meant to last for days. It was meant for slow asphyxiation. It was meant to prolong torture. It was the Roman soldier's job. It was meant to be used by Caesar, but instead, it was used by God. It was meant to stop a movement, but instead, it became the way. It was meant to act on fear, but instead, it awakened faith. It was meant to be vicious and violent, but instead, it became our peace. It was meant to uproot hope, but instead, it became the seed. It was meant to punish captives, but instead, it unleashed freedom. It was meant to build up Rome, but instead, it built God's kingdom. It was meant to discourage rebels. It was meant to stop insurrection. It was meant to put down Jesus, but instead, it set up his resurrection. It was meant to jeer and mock him, but instead it was his glory. It was meant to erase a chapter, but instead it became the story. It was meant to hold up convicts, but instead it raised up a king. It was meant to shut our mouth, but instead it's why we sing. It was meant to be a judgment, but instead it became our mercy. It's why the song of heaven is the lamb. The lamb is worthy. It was meant to kill an enemy, crush dissenters and diversion, but instead it became the banner of God's love for every person. It was meant to be appalling, nailing hands and feet to wood. It was meant to be used for evil, but instead it was used for good. It was meant to be a symbol of God's assassination. But instead, it became the symbol of Jesus' invitation. Come to the cross. Instead of sin and stain, you are meant to be made clean. Instead of being forgotten, you are meant to know your seen. Instead of being ashamed, you can leave behind your guilt. Instead of feeling empty, you were meant to be fulfilled. Instead of being broken, you are meant to be made whole. Here, Calvary is calling. It beckons you. Behold, come to the cross. Instead of being an accident, you have a purpose and a plan. Instead of being abandoned, you were chosen by his hand. For all who've said, I can't, God has said, I can. No matter what you've done, the invitation stands. Come to the cross. Instead of being doubtful, you are meant to know your father. You are meant to be his son, and you are meant to be his daughter. You were cherished from the start. You were always in the picture. Instead of being a victim, you were meant to be a victor. The result of Jesus' blood, salvation has arrived. Instead of being dead, you are meant to be alive. The cross, it was meant to signal death, but instead, it's a sign of living. It was meant to be the end, but instead, it's our beginning.
is our prayer and hope that as we gather together this Easter weekend, that all of you will be able to come to the cross and let not the cross be just a theological truth, but let the cross be a truth that is made personal to you and made personal to your heart today and this weekend. We have the privilege today to have Dr. Living Lee with us to continue this series for our Easter weekend. And just a short introduction. He is the chairman and elder of People's Park Baptist Church in Pataling Jaya. He is married to Grace and he has four children and six grandchildren. I've been told that he loves fishing as well. Uh, you may call him an aficionado of fishing. <laughs> and because there are a few people in our church that loves fishing as well. Yeah. So you can ask him and talk to him about it. He has shared with us yesterday um, about Jesus' crucifixion. That it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a mistake. That Jesus wasn't a victim of the circumstances. Instead, Jesus willingly and resolutely submitted to the will of his Father to die on the cross, to take our place on the cross, to die for our sins so that we may have life. He challenged us to die with Christ, to die to self so that we may live with Christ. Easter Sunday can never happen without Good Friday. So it's a challenge for us. What does Good Friday mean for us? So today we will continue our reflection looking at the Holy Sat Saturday. And we will also be spending a bit more time to let God's Word to soak and for us to digest and to reflect further. After the sermon, we will be spending some time in small groups so that we can dwell deeper on what we have heard yesterday and also today. Uh, and then after the sharing, I will be uh, closing out time in prayer and benediction. Come, let's pray before I invite Dr. Living Lee. Father in heaven, we come to the cross once again this evening. Speak to us through your servant. Challenge us once again. And bring a word of comfort to us as well. Lord, we pray that the cross will be made personal to each one of us, to each of our season in our life, here, today, now. So we commit the rest of our time into your hands. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for this privilege that we are able to look to your word, to learn, and to seek to follow you more closely and to obey you more wholeheartedly. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Livingly. evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And as I was preparing the three uh, messages for Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and, and uh, Easter Sunday, I found Holy Saturday the hardest one to, 
to prepare because in our what you call Protestant tradition, we hardly give any attention to it. You know, uh, we we focus very much on Good Friday when Christ died, and then very much on Easter Sunday when Christ rose. You see. But Holy Saturday, you know, uh, we ha- hardly hear of anything uh, that helps us with it. Uh, okay. Right, okay. I hope I pressed the right one. This yesterday I didn't know I was pressing the the go back button instead of the advance button, you see. So today hopefully it got it right. Now, yesterday in, in Good Friday, it ended with John chapter 19. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. That's John chapter 19. Okay? When you go to John chapter 20, uh, John chapter 20, sorry, uh, is that okay? John chapter 20, what you get is Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from its entrance. Good Friday, he was laid in the tomb. Then after that, straight away, it jumps to Easter Easter Sunday already. Mary went to the tomb and it was open. Hey, what happened to Saturday, is it? John's Gospel was silent on that. And so, because of this uh, so-called lack of information given to us in the Gospels, uh, uh, there's a lot of speculation. And in the, the early church, huh, the, 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 more, more so in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they come up with a lot of, uh, and, and Roman Catholic tradition, you know, where do the dead go, what happens to them before the, you know, uh, the, the resurrection and so on and all that. So yesterday, uh, we started with the journey to the resurrection and I took the analogy of the seed. Jesus said the seed must die, yeah? In order for new life to spring forth. So yesterday, we saw the seed dying, Get, and then, how, how did it die to bring forth new life? It must be buried. And that is what we are going to look at today. Huh? For seeds to reach their potential, they must be buried before they can sprout. Now, if you bury a seed, huh, you can't see anything on the surface, you know. And suddenly, next thing you know is that you have buried the seed, covered it with soil, and then you, the next thing you see is the, the, the seed sprout, you know, sprouting out already. What happens when it's buried down there, you don't see, you know. And I think that is similar to the problem that we have with Jesus' death and after that, the, the barrier, Holy Saturday, and then before we so see Him coming alive again on, on Sunday, you see. So the big question that has been sort of uh, being asked about Holy Saturdays. Where was Jesus for the three days between his death and resurrection? After he has died, and then you saw the resurrection. Where was he in between, you see? Uh, and although we don't get it in the Gospels, but we get hints of it uh, in Jesus' conversation before he, you know, way before his, his crucifixion, and also in letters that. Peter wrote, or Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and so on. So those give us some some clues, you know, not definite like the gospel narratives, you see, but some clues of what happened. So for example, uh, when when Jesus was was challenged to give them a sign, he said, for as Jonah was uh, three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, 
No, Jonah sank down and was swallowed by this monster fish. Okay? Uh, he says, So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth. And of course, where is the heart of the earth? So these kind of questions pop up. And so, we are, the, 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 the question is asked, did Jesus descend into hell? When, you know, because in the, the Nicene Creed, for example, when, when they re, you know, uh, recite the Nicene Creed, it says uh, uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, you know, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and then after that he was buried, and then he descended into hell, you see. Uh, although that is not in any of the scriptures, descend, he descended into hell. Uh, and so, in the tradition, not so much in our, like I say, the Protestants, we, we hardly know about it or hear about it. But Holy Saturday, the Eastern Orthodox, and then also uh, started with the medieval times and then the, the Roman Catholics also, you know, some, some of them still have, have this. Holy Saturday is the harrowing of hell. Well, we'll, we'll go into a bit more on that. What is the harrowing of hell? The harrowing of hell uh, is a dramatic interpretation of Christ storming hell to release all the souls of the faithful, going back to Adam and Eve. So if you look at this... Uh, uh, icon from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, you have got uh, Jesus and then breaking it down the doors, the, the brass doors of hell and then rescuing or bringing forth uh, Mary and Ad, uh, not, not Mary, Adam and Eve, the first ones who were sort of like, you know, the forerunners for the rest of the human race, the, all the prophets and everybody uh, who, after they died, they were in this place of the underworld called Hades or, or, or hell. Uh, so, and, and the word harrowing, what, what is harrowing? It's something that is intensely, you know, disturbing. You know, I have a harrowing experience. You know, very disturbing experience. So Jesus invaded hell in such a way that it, it struck terror, you know, into the 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 the, the the occupants of, of, of hell uh, who were holding all these so-called saints captive, is it? Uh, so that's what the harrowing of hell is supposed uh, to be. A dramatic interpretation of Christ storming hell to release all the souls of the faithful going back to Adam and Eve. But did Jesus descend into hell? So, like I, I said, you know, it's not there in the Bible, but in the Apostles' Creed, uh, uh, it says, He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and then He descended into hell. It's one of the confessions the early church make when they, they have, uh, uh, the, when they re re recite the Apostles' Creed. Did Jesus endure further suffering in hell after His death on the cross? So some, some speculated at that time. You know, he, he died. Uh, suffering on the cross is one part, but then to identify fully with humanity, he even suffered the horrors of hell, which has no biblical basis. Huh? Okay? The phrase, he descended into hell, does not occur in the Bible. It is contained in today's version of the Apostles' Creed. Okay? So, we have to take note of, of that. So, if he did not go into hell... <laughs> Where did he go after he was put into the tomb, is it? Uh, to paradise? So there's an, another uh, a group of people who turned to when Jesus was dying on the cross. They, he was not alone. There were two thieves or rebels beside him who were crucified. And at first, both of them sort of questioned him, but finally one of them, you know, told the other one, we deserve our death sentence, but not, not, not this person. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus answer him? I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And so many people 
uh, take this interpretation that by that, Jesus means today, the day that he was crucified, he will bring the, the dying thief, uh, some gave it the name Dimas, uh, you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus, where was he <laughs> in the missing day? Uh, he, on Holy Saturday, he was in paradise and bringing to, with him uh, the dying thief who trusted in him. So to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Then where did Christ go? I, I, I say there are two passages which usually is referred to to try to give us, get a clue on where he goes. What first, the first one is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 20. He says, For Christ also died for sin, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. That's what he accomplished on the cross. Dying in our place to take away the punishment for our sins. Having been put to death in the flesh, he made a life in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Now what is, where is this prison? What is this prison? Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. So, there were these people who were, during the time of Noah, you know, who did not believe and the warnings of, that Noah gave them. And, 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 and of course, they perished in the flood. And so, it says these this, uh, uh, people are trapped in some kind of a place in which a few, there's eight persons only brought through safety, through the water, the rest all perish. And where have they gone? You know, they were supposed to be in prison, bound. And Jesus, when he died for sins, he went down and the harrowing of hell took place. And he, he, he you know, did something with, with these people uh, who, who died in the time of Noah. What is this prison? Where is this prison? And that has, has spawned a lot of... Uh, Speculation. So if you go and look at Roman Catholic theology, uh, they've got purgatory for, you know, where the date goes. And then after that, they have got uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the three different layers of, of you, you know, the, 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 the place, uh, what's, what's the name? Start, start with L. <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, three, the, the, the different places in, in so-called Hades or hell, where people of different category of, of, of sinfulness and all that are, are, are kept, you see. So the lower parts of the earth, what is it? Is it? Therefore, it says, the other passage is, of course, in Ephesians 4, 8 to 10. It says, when he ascended on high, he, held, he led captive, that's Christ led captive, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Now, where is that? What is that? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. This is, of course, referring to Christ's triumphant exaltation, you know, after crucifixion and, and uh, the, the final triumph of leading the train of captives in parades, you know, into heaven, you see. But again, what is this lower parts of the earth? So, we look at how the Old Testament people think, how the New Testament people think uh, about where do the date go, okay? Old Testament, you have heaven or paradise, the spirit of, of for the righteous date, uh, date. In the New Testament, you have heaven or paradise, the spirit of the righteous date. And in the story of, of the rich man and, and Lazarus, the, you know, the beggar, he says he was in Abraham's bosom. That is the, a way of descriptive of heaven or paradise. And also in the Old Testament, you have got this mention of Sheol, the New Testament equivalent is Hades, okay? Uh, or Sheol or the pit. There's, in general, it says the date, the grave, 
for all the dead, pray for all the dead, whether righteous or, or unrighteous. You know, all the dead goes to Sheol or to Hades. Uh, but in some instances, it's also say that it is the spirits of the wicked dead who are in show. I mean, it is for all dead, spirits of the wicked dead will, you know, also be found in, in show together with, with uh, the, the righteous dead, you see. So spirit of the wicked dead. But what happens is, uh, and also there's a special place uh, for fallen angels called Abaddon or the Abyss. Okay, uh, and in, in 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 it's both in the New Testament and Old Testament, and so they they say in the, that's the intermediate state before the final state after the great white throne judgment and the end of times. Uh, so this is Old Testament and New Testament, and including the present time. Lah. Then what happens right at the end for all eternity is that there will be a new heaven and a new earth for the redeemed. And there will be the lake of fire, hell or lake of fire or Gehana for those who are not safe. Okay? So, and that is the, the, the final uh, state. And even death and Hades will be cast into the, the lake of fire in the end. So that is the general picture that we can gather from the Old and New Testament about where do the dead go, you see. Uh, so, we, we say Christ went, where did He go on Holy Saturday? He says to the lower parts of the earth, but what, what is that? Which part, you know? Show Hades? Or as some believe, the heroine of hell to set free those imprisoned uh, spirits. We are not sure. We are uncertain. Much speculation. Okay? And when Christ went there, what did He do? It says in 1 Peter 4, 6, For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the Spirit according to the will of God. So did Christ go there to preach to the dead, people, the dead souls so that they can, like some speculate, have a second, second chance of accepting the, the gospel and, 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 and be saved, you see? Uh, most theologians will not subs subscribe to that. But the Bible translation says if you if you translate it as, I, I think the NLT does, for the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are now dead. That means at one time they were alive. Now they are dead. Then what decisions they have made when they were alive and the gospel was preached to them stands and they end up where they are now. So Christ did not go down and preach to dead people then. Those, those people are dead now, but He did it when they were. The gospel was preached to them when they were alive. Now they are dead, but, you know. So they may live in the Spirit according to the will of God. Preached to them when they were alive, and they are set free from their sins. Although now they, may be, they are dead. Uh, Christ did not preach that to them when they are in the dead state, but preached to them when they were alive. So again, this is unclear, okay? So the, the heroine of hell, uh, in Christian theology, the heroine of hell is an old English and Middle English term referring to the time between the crucifixion, okay? Yeah. Between the crucifixion of Jesus and His resurrection. And in triumphant descent, Christ brought salvation to the souls held captive there since the beginning of the world. There is one interpretation, the storming of hell, you know, in, in spectacular fashion, in a very disturbing way, okay, harrowing. But there's another explanation for harrowing, uh, that is, in the old days uh, when they were plowing the field, uh, they have got this rake which sort of separate the stones from the soil, you know. 
Okay? And that's called harrow. So harrowing, some thick, uh, uh, biblical archaeologists say that it refers to Christ ploughing and separating the unjust from the just who are in this, together in this place of, of Sheol or Hades, you see. Uh, and, and, and that's the other explanation for heroin. Again, we are unclear whether this is the correct interpretation or not. So when you think about all this, uh, uh, you know, the thing that disturbs a lot of, of people is, of course, this concept of hell. You know? And during Jesus' time, Jesus warned the people. He says in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And, and who is this person? Only God can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, Satan and all that, they can destroy your body, but they cannot destroy your, your soul, is it? So, Jesus said, don't fear Him, but fear God. Serve God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So, you, you, you think, when people think of hell, they think of the lake of fire and in, in Revelation 21, 8, we are told clearly who are those who will be in this place. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic, the idolaters, and all liars, and they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Lake of fire. I think a lot of people are troubled by this question of what happened to those who have not heard of the gospel because they were born before the time of Jesus Christ or those who are in the deep jungle and, uh, you know, uh, places not reached by, by the gospel or missionaries and so on and all that. Do they automatically all just go to hell because of original sin? And, and many people are disturbed and say that, you know, uh, God is will be so unfair if he sent people to, to hell for not responding to the gospel when they have no chance to hear about the gospel and respond to the gospel. But people are not sent to hell uh, for, not, for having, not having the chance to say the sinner's prayer, you know, as, as some would put it as, you know, the, the thing that gets you to, to, to heaven. You, you, you say the sinner's prayer and, and you know, invite Jesus into your heart and take away all your sins and then you go to heaven. You see. There is such a thing as God judging, you know, the wicked, the, those who are evil, those who oppose Him, whether they have a chance to hear or don't hear the gospel, you know, these are the ones who God will condemn. But as for those who have not heard or babies are born dead and, you know, died young before they even have an uh, ability to respond and all that. They say, oh, so unfair, you know, automatically God, God sent them to hell. Let's not assume that, you know. Because when we say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, uh, no one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, it is a truth that's if Jesus has not come, if He has not died on the cross for our sins, uh, all of us will be condemned because, you know, we die in our sins. But the efficacy of His death on the cross uh, can be much more wider than limited to, the, to those who have a chance to hear the gospel and respond and, and you know, and pray and invite Jesus into their life as Lord and Savior. So what we share with people sometimes when we're sharing the gospel is this. If you have heard and you reject, you know, 
then you are condemned. But if you have heard and you believe and you receive, you are saved. That much is certain. But for those who have not heard, God is fair, God is just, and He will deal with them in a way He sees fit. Let God be God in this matter. For those who have never heard, but people are not automatically sent to hell for just not having heard the gospel. There's evil, there's wickedness, either real or potential in their life that condemns them to hell. So, there's so much uncertainty, isn't it? When we think of Holy Saturday, what, what happened, you know? Uh, there's, and yet, there's so much grief and, and, and built into it is so much hope. I was thinking of the, the Mary, the disciples and all that. You know, Peter, John and all those people. You're the one who is your hope. He's nailed to the cross. He's died. You've taken his body, you've buried in the tomb. Now, Friday was a very intense day, you know. A day of great activity, you know. Rushing from the trial to, you know, the crucifixion. And then after that, the quickly have to take down before sundown for, for the Sabbath is going to start. And, and quickly bundle him with the spices and put him in the tomb and and then they said, if not for the Sabbath law, I think they will have continued to be busy and, and rushing about and all that. Sometimes we, we have to thank God for the Sabbath. Now. By law, you stop everything. You don't rush about doing anything anymore. And you just wait in silence. What can you do? You, you, you're not allowed to, you know, although well, well, Mary, they all must have been a hundred and one things in their mind, you know. What, what, what's to do with Jesus and all that? Stop, God says. Sabbath. Stop. Wait in silence. But waiting in silence doesn't mean nothing is happening, you know, the seed that's buried in the ground. A lot of things is happening. You went to Hades or hell to you know, and, and, and so on. With, uh, and with, in the storming of, 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 of he, the herring of hell, uh, actually one of the traditions is the Eastern Orthodox people practice is that Jesus didn't go there and invade hell just by himself, you know. He brought along Dimas, <laughs> the, the thief who was, you know, crucified with him. And they, they you know, raided hell and set free all this... this uh, a righteous date, is it? And brought them out. We don't know whether that, ha that happened or not. You see? But that was the, the, the picture. Uncertainty, grief for, for them. Jesus is dead. He's buried. We can't do anything for Him anymore. It's the Sabbath. And I remember once when <laughs> somebody was teaching us about rest, uh, the need for, for stopping and going on. Uh. He says on the motorway, uh, they have often have this sign, you know, it is the rest stop that keeps you going. You need to pause, you stop, you're too tired to go on, you, have, you, you need to rest to recoup, and then after that you have the strength to go on. If not for the rest stops, uh, you keep on driving, uh, you have micro sleep or whatever it is, you drive off the road or you drive into the, you know, the back of somebody's truck or something like that, you see. It's the rest that keeps you going. And I think it's the wisdom of God to say, six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day, cease rest. And that is, I think, one of the very hard things for most of us to do in our busy, busy life, busy, busy world. 
It's the rest that keeps you going. So what is it? Holy Saturday. What is it? It's a time to wait. You wouldn't plant a seed and then dig it up every few minutes to see if it has grown, isn't it? That's silly. You know, you plant a seed and then you want to see what the progress is, is happening. Uh, every few minutes you dig it up and what will happen? This, you know, the seed won't, won't be able to grow. It will even die, you see. So, once you've planted the seed, it's below ground, you can't see anymore. It's beyond you to do anything already. God takes over whatever is happening down there. You know, He knows and you have to trust Him. Time is the only difference between the seed and the harvest. So it's, it's very wise, I think, when, when, when Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3, uh, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. So time is the only difference between the seed that's planted and the harvest that is to come. So while we are resting up here or outside the tomb and Jesus is inside the tomb or, and doing whatever, you know, God has given to him to do. Let's take comfort in this. Jesus told us, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So the parting on Holy Sabbath, Holy Saturday, is temporary. It's not that Jesus just lie there in the tomb and do nothing. We take comfort that this parting is temporary. He's gone ahead to prepare a place for us. And it's so comforting. We always refer to these passages. Uh, just about a month ago, I did three funerals for church members within a span of less than two weeks. But there's, there's such a comfort to know that they're not just dead and gone and don't know where, you know, whether they've gone to heaven or hell or Sheol or what, but they've gone to be with the Lord and Jesus has gone to prepare a place for them. In my Father's house are many mansions. That is what He has told us and promised us. So, our struggles in uncertain times. Was there any certainty to any of the, the, the things that we, you, you know, uh, uh, say about, about Holy Saturday, where Jesus was, what He was doing, and so on and all that? There was no certainty. And imagine for the, the, the disciples at that time, the master is buried. They're not allowed to do anything because the Sabbath is upon them. And so in, in such a situation, what, what can you do? It was a very distressing time, you know. But yet, you're not allowed to do anything. It's an enforced rest and you can only wait in silence. Wait in silence. How many of us can tolerate and wait in silence? Well, people just cannot. They say they'll go mad if, if you, you know, cut them off from their gadgets, from their people, from interacting with people and all that. Just cannot. But this is an enforced silence which was necessary which was good for them. So the question in our struggles, in uncertain times, maybe you have lost a, a, a recently like th those people in my church, they've just lost a, a loved one. You know? 
Where is Jesus now? You ask that, that question. On that holy Saturday, the disciples, Mary and the others, they know that His body is in the tomb. But where is He now? So, we take comfort in the phrase in 1 Corinthians 5.13, absent in body, but present in spirit. Of course, this Paul was referring to he and the relationship with the Corinthians. Uh. But with Jesus, it's all the more real, isn't it? Jesus' body lies in the tomb, separated from them, absent in body. But that doesn't mean that Jesus is not with them because He's with them in spirit. And so when people ask, and hey, you can't see Jesus and all that, how do you know that Jesus is with you? Jesus is in my heart, like the, the, the little the Sunday school song we sing, you know? He asked me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. So, in this time of uncertainty, maybe even of grief, let's reflect. And, and, and after this, you will, you will do this reflection in small groups or, or whatever it is. Where is Jesus now on this Holy Saturday? Are you struggling with uncertainties or grief in His apparent absence? He's present, but He's buried, you know? unseen is he in your heart what is he doing there that gives you a certain hope in the resurrection that is to come okay thank you very much for point of reflection for today we will spend some time in small groups of four or five, uh, would encourage you to, to share just one thing that God has impressed upon your heart, one thing that uh, uh, you felt you've been struck uh, by what God is trying to speak to you. Uh, and you do not need to give an answer to all of the questions, uh, just maybe one of it would be helpful. And I'll give you about uh, 15 minutes and, and then I will come back up to, to close today's session. Okay? Just 15 minutes. <coughs> okay. Now you may gather into small groups.
Okay, thank you so much for sharing in your groups and for processing together the things that you have heard uh, and sharing what you have learned and what was meaningful to you. I hope that you will continue to ponder and reflect on these thoughts and work it out with the Lord and see how God is speaking to you, not just during this Easter season, but uh, even after the Easter season. Making the cross something that is meaningful and personal to you. Come, let us close in prayer. Father in heaven, on Holy Saturday, we share the grief and the sense of hopelessness that Jesus' disciples and his loved ones would have felt as Jesus was left buried in the tomb on Holy Saturday. Lord, even in our own lives, when we experience loss, grief, times of uncertainty and confusion, times of unanswered prayers, times that we need to deal with doubts that we have, the times that we may feel hopeless and helpless. Help us, Lord, to wait upon you. Help us to rest in you. Help us to be still. To be still and to know that you are God. May we be comforted that Easter day is coming. That a new dawn is coming. That new life will emerge. That sin and death has been defeated. And in the risen Christ, we can have an eternal hope. The hope that all things will be made new, that all things will work out for good, according to your good and gracious will in each of our lives. And now for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Here ends the Holy Saturday service. Uh, if you like a cup of coffee or tea, you may help yourself uh, at the foyer outside. So tomorrow we will be celebrating Easter Sunday together at 9 a.m. And we will have Dr. Living Lee with us uh, as well tomorrow to close up the Easter weekend series. Okay, good night. Have a good rest.